What is your American dream? My American dream is one day opening my um, Fifth Avenue craft couture shop, classy men and women's shop. The first African inspired clothing accessories on Fifth Avenue. Right in front of Pumped Arm Tower. Successful and free, you know? Yeah, it's all about being successful. My American dream is to be one of the best known chef there is, yeah. That's 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 where I wanna be now. I wanna be I wanna be known. And to be the best I can be. My dream is to be with my family and be able to take care of my family um, the best way I possibly can. I've had two more children since I've come here and um, being in the United States has its benefits for my children. Everyone has a right to the American dream. Welcome everybody. My name is Brad Bernstein. It is Hump Day, Wednesday, October 14th. I am in my apartment. Uh, I am quarantining out of precaution. I am not sick. There is nobody that needs to wish me well. Nobody needs to say a prayer for me. I feel perfect. I was traveling in Turkey for two weeks for my birthday. I came back I'm quarantining for at least seven days here in my apartment, which is why we're doing the show for my apartment. Uh, and I will be back in studio with Yo-Yo and Nesquik on Monday. In the meantime, this is, we're going old school here. Old school going back a few months when all of New York was quarantined. Uh, we're going old school with pop-up quarantine edition Brad Show Live. Uh, let me say hello to the entire Brad squad. I'm going to start on uh, Facebook, YouTube, YouTube, Facebook, Facebook. Let's start on Facebook. Hello, Joan Grant squad up, Dion Watson squad up, Violet Blackwood squad up, Uncle Brad and the entire squad family. Christy Gonzalez squad up, Lady K. Charles saying squad up to everybody. Star girl Mika. She is saying it all. She says the queen is here. Squad up y'all. Dion Watson, squad up, Jessica Limi, Joel, how are you, my dear? And uh, who else we got? Dion Reed, squad up. Uh, Marcia McCullough popping in, Christy Consali, Martha Danielle Antamabo. I hope I'm pronouncing your, right, your name right, Martha. I see you watching. Uh, Myola Douglas. Also see you watching. Myrtle Ray, how are you? Rosemary James is also uh, watching as well. Let's go over to YouTube. Let's see what's going on on YouTube. Avar M, without even saying squat up, without even saying hello to anybody, pops in right with a question. So I guess I might as well answer it because... They are bar am very anxious to make sure that we get the immigration question uh, asked and answered. Uh, so a bar M first comment of the day on YouTube. I'm applying for a U visa on the 13th of February, 2017. How long do you think I have to wait until I get approved for the U visa and how long for the green card? U visas are very, very tough, not tough in the sense that, tough to get approved because it's it's actually more of a simple case. You have to show that you're the victim of a crime, you assisted law enforcement, you had an injury. That's what you need to get for a U visa. The problem with a U visa is they only give it out to 10,000 people a year. So because they only give it out to 10,000 people a year, and there are more than 100,000 immigrants who have been the victims of serious crimes perpetrated on them by Americans. You don't hear Donald Trump ever, come, you know, bringing the 100,000 immigrants who were the victims of crimes to the State of the Union and standing them up and saying, look at this person, he was the victim of a crime. This family member was the victim of a crime. You never see that. 
You only see American citizen standing up. Look, he was the victim of a crime by undocumented alien. Uh, but there's a lot more, over 100,000 people who have applied for a U visa. That means more than 100,000 people who are undocumented have been victims of crimes, serious crimes in America. And since they only give 10,000 a year, do the math. It's going to be years and years and years and years and years before um, before you get approved, unfortunately, maybe five, six years. And then from that time on, then you have to wait from the time your U visa is approved three more years, three more years before you can apply for your green card. So the U visa, unfortunately, is an extraordinarily, extraordinarily long period of time. Now, what the law says with a U visa is that once you get your U visa approved, you're entitled to get your work permit but you're waiting years and years and years. You can also apply for a work permit while you're waiting on the U visa if your U visa has been pending for more than six months and you can show humanitarian reasons. So if you have not applied of RM for your work permit, you should do that at least based on humanitarian reasons. Let's go back saying hello to the squad. Neville O'Connor saying, welcome back, Brad. Uh, Oh, gosh. Mundo Adiri with another immigration question. People are just popping in with the questions right away. You know, there's a cadence. Right, Julie? A cadence. A cadence. A flow. A flow to the show. We say hello, then we answer the questions. Say, squat up, Brad. Squat up, family. Squat up, crew. We don't pop right in with the question. We never do that. But we're doing that today. All right. It is what it is. Mundo Adri, is it safe to travel using the advanced parole if you've overstayed on your visa? It absolutely is. Uh, advanced parole is safe to travel as long as it is short periods of time. Don't, don't leave the country for months and months and months and months and months uh, because then they're going to say... You stayed out for too long. Advanced parole is for short trips, two, three weeks, four weeks. I wouldn't stay out more than a month on advanced parole. But doing short trips, absolutely. Thumbs up for advanced parole. Jessica Kalimi, squad up. So this is how we do it now. Jessica Kalimi, squad up. Asila Enot, squad up. Shan Shan, squad up. How are you? Cameron Drown saying hello. Omari Palmer saying, hey, good evening, Brad. How are you? Uh, Gemma, Kane, we're going to come back to the rest of the questions. We got to say hello to people first. Daniel K, squad up. How are you? Amin Umar uh, has a question. Ask it. I'm going to answer the questions in a little bit. I promise you. Uh, Leslie Benoit, how are you? Everybody popping in with questions right away. I will answer everybody's question. I'm going to go back into the chat and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to answer everybody's question. Uh, who else we have here? Um, Vanessa Contreras. Do we know a Vanessa Contreras? We <gasps> Nesquik, how are you? Nesquik, what's going on? Hey, Nesquik, boss lady. We'll see you back in the studio on Monday. Jeff Bosey popping in on Facebook saying happy hump day. It is hump day. I'm doing hump day all by myself today. Uh, for those who don't watch regularly, hump day, you'll find out what it is. Uh, before we go into schmoozing, however, I do have to remind everybody, if you like this show, if you like watching me, you like watching Yo-Yo, you like watching Vanessa, you like this entire thing, the entire enchilada, the entire enchilada. If you like the whole enchilada, please subscribe on YouTube. Subscribe to our show. Every time you, we come live, you will get a ding. Now, you don't always have to watch, but it's always good to have a ding say, ah, they'll be on live right now. Uh, so please subscribe. Please let your friends and family know that I come on every day around this time, Monday through Friday, except if I'm really exhausted on vacation or it's my birthday. Uh, so we come on most of the time. Uh, and I come and answer your immigration questions here every day to the best of my ability. I, I, give, it, I give it all. I give you everything I got. Like it or not, this is what it is. All right. On Facebook, on Facebook, you know, 
you can like and follow us. If you like and follow us, you'll also get a ding. Believe it or not, there'll be a ding either way. Ding on YouTube, a ding on Facebook, a beep, whatever you want to call it, a bell, whatever it may be that your phone rings. But you'll get something that says we are live. Also, 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 please let your friends and family know that at about 20 minutes or so after my schmooze and our hump day news, we will be answering everybody's immigration questions live in our uh, comment section. Come Monday, we'll be back in studio. We'll be taking calls too. But right now, we will just be answering it live in our uh, comment section. And with that, squad, let's do something we like to call schmoozing with Brad. All right. So uh, congratulations to the entire crew at Brad Show Live. We are again finalists in the Synopsis 2020 Digital Awards. For those of you who don't know what Synopsis is, it is a very prestigious advertising magazine. Uh, and uh, we have been finalists for several years. We're up against huge, huge, generally, I don't know who we're up against this year, but in the past, We've been up against huge, huge production companies such as you know, Ellen DeGeneres and World Wrestling Federation and uh, a television broadcast network called uh, NBC. You know, huge, huge companies. And our little, little show with our little group of people, we go up against all of them and we are finalists again. We've been nominated in three categories. The uh, categories we were nominated in is best host in a web series. Yay, Brad. That's me, best host in a web series, best multi-platform marketing campaign, and best web video or series. The virtual award ceremony happens Tuesday on December 1st. We will be there. Hopefully, uh, we will get an award, and if so, we will let you know. Thank you to the whole Brad Show Live team, the entire Brad squad. Of course, we can't do it without you guys. If we get an award, the award is for not only... Bradshaw Live, not only our crew, but it's also for you, squad, because this show doesn't happen without a squad. It doesn't. It's not the same. If we have no squad, it's just not the same. So uh, this award is just as well. Hopefully we win for you guys as well as for us. Meanwhile, tomorrow, uh, this is like the most bizarre thing ever. Trump's going to be participating in a town hall event on NBC at the same exact time Joe Biden is going to be in a town hall event on ABC. What the hell's going on here? Well, they were supposed to have a debate on ABC, but Trump has coronavirus. And Biden, I can't blame the guy, doesn't want to get coronavirus. So he said, uh, unless we're going to do this virtually or unless, you know, we're going to be in different rooms somehow, I don't want to be in the same room as the orange man. I don't want to get coronavirus. I, and personally, I wouldn't want to be in that room with him either. So uh, they canceled They canceled the event, and Biden agreed to do the town hall nevertheless. And Trump says, I'm not going to do it virtually. I'm not coming. So instead, he went to NBC. NBC has said they will do a town hall for Trump at the same exact time. So who are you supposed to watch? Trump, Biden, Biden, Trump? I don't know. Now, uh the event uh, for NBC is going to be moderated by Savannah Guthrie, who is going to sit 12 feet away from uh, Donald Trump. There's going to be a live attendance. People are going to be required to wear a mask. Trump is down in the national polls. Yay, national polls. And uh, Biden is winning in key swing states. Go key swing states. And Trump is definitely in greater need of a national platform in which he can make his case to voters. The NBC's decision has caused backlash on social media by people who believe the competing town halls are going to disenfranchise viewers who want to watch both events. The hashtag boycott NBC is trending on Twitter. Uh, I think Trump is going to brag that he got more viewers on NBC than ABC. Uh, I'm going to watch Biden. Meanwhile, with just 20 days to go until the election, more than 12 million Americans have already voted, smashing records from 2016. 
I, ladies and gentlemen, I have in my hand my absentee ballot. I, after this show, will be voting in about an hour. I just got it in the mail today. Uh, but unfortunately, apparently there are problems. A technical glitch at a voting super site, hours long, hours long lines and a last minute court ru ruling have marked the start of in-person voting in Georgia. Big problems there. More than one and a half million Georgians have requested ballots so far, shattering records from the past. Footage went viral on social media. Voters lined up in Columbus, a suburb of Atlanta, leading some Democrats to raise allegations of voter suppression. Uh, early voting at the State Farm Arena in Atlanta was delayed for about an hour after technical problems with the electronic poll books. Virginia voter registration websites temporarily crashed for the last day for people to register. Election officials have blamed a cut in the fiber cable. Now civil rights groups have filed lawsuits against the state to extend the voter registration deadline. Meanwhile, the this is a weird, weird thing going on in California. The California Secretary of State and Department of Justice has sent a cease and desist order to the California Republican Party to remove unofficial ballot drop boxes placed in at least three counties. Apparently, the Republican National Party is putting unofficial ballot drop boxes in places where Republican voters would, would go and vote, like gun shops and the local Republican, you know, party office. And these are all unofficial ballot drops that they're saying that they're collecting unofficial ballots. And, you know, you're saying, well, why are they doing that? Are they trying to fool people into, uh, nobody really understands why they're doing it. I've never read anything that, you know, why they're doing it. But you can, you know, my first guess was they want to fool people to say, here, drop your ballot here when they know that that ballot wouldn't be counted. But then that really doesn't make a lot of sense because we know the Democrats are going to win California. So what is it that they're doing? I heard another theory that they are getting Republicans to go and drop their ballots in a box in Republican strongholds. And then after the election, they're going to show up and say, look, voter fraud, all of these votes, all of these ballots, they were found in the river. They were found in a dumpster. Look, this whole election is fraudulent. Maybe that's what they're doing. I don't know. Now, California only allows county election officials the authority to oversee drop boxes and ensure that they're in compliance with the law. In New York, the commissioner of the New York Police Department told all uniform members to prepare to be deployed for protests. There is not a cop in New York that's allowed to take a vacation the week leading up to the election and the week after the election. The entire New York Police Department is going to be in uniform and out on the street. You will never see it. You will not see a New York City cop anywhere on vacation during those weeks. Now, in Washington, Amy Coney Barrett faces another round of questioning. She is the judge who is up for confirmation hearings for the United States Supreme Court. Today was day three of the confirmation hearings. Senator Lindsey Graham, the Republican of South Carolina and the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, praised Barrett for being unashamedly pro-life, uh, saying her confirmation will be a breakthrough for conservative women. Now, asked by Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont whether, court, whether courts had the power to enforce their rulings if a president disobeyed, uh, i.e., Donald Trump doesn't always obey court rulings, the judge would not give a definitive answer. All she said is, no man is above the law. As a matter of law, the Supreme Court may have the final word, but it lacks control about what happens after that. And that's true. The Supreme Court doesn't have a police department to go enforce the law. They just rule the law. This is the law, and then hopefully somebody is going to enforce it. Meanwhile, uh, talking about the United States Supreme Court, they are, are now allowing the Trump administration to immediately end the counting for the 2020 census. Experts have warned that doing so would result in an inaccurate data with severe consequences for the next decade. The ruling has essentially cut short the counting of every living American resident. Now, the, the, the counting was supposed to continue through October 31st, meaning two more weeks, because not every American has been counted. And the reason why this is important is for three reasons. When we count all Americans, when um, we know how to apportion 
uh, money that is allocated by Congress to different states. So for example, if Congress passes a bill that says, we're gonna give $2 trillion to transportation. Well, that gets allocated based on the number of people in each particular state. It also plays a role in the Electoral College. I'm sure everybody has heard about the Electoral College by now. It's been around for 250 years. And uh, it, the Electoral College is determined by how many people live in each state. So now when people are not counted, the Electoral College may, be not, ac may not be accurate compared to, the to proportionally the number of people who live in each particular state. It also uh, counts the number of representatives, the number of representatives each state can give to Congress. So if you have an undercount in one particular state, that state may not be represented proportionally in Congress. Now, why, why is this important? Why are they cutting it short? Because Trump feels that the people who have been undercounted are more likely to be Democrats, more likely to be immigrants, more likely to be people living in the inner city who may or may not know what the census is, may not want to be counted. Uh, and as a result, it's all to skew in favor of Republicans. Now the court did not, Supreme Court did not offer any explanation for its order, uh, which came after the Trump administration asked the justices to pause a lower court ruling, extending the count while the case was appealed. Uh, there's a speculation also that the White House wants to ensure that Trump can oversee the allocation of U.S. House seats, even if he loses re-election and push to exclude undocumented immigrants from the total. Coronavirus is still around. It didn't leave magically. It just didn't disappear. Remember Trump said, oh, it'll disappear by magic. Uh, by September, it'll all be over. Well, we're already in October and uh, there's 38 million coronavirus cases worldwide. More than 1 million people have died. More than 7.8 million people have been diagnosed in America. Today, 216,000 deaths. I think yesterday was 208,000, if I remember. So 8,000 people died since I was last on the show 24 hours ago. So for anybody to say coronavirus doesn't exist, 8,000 people died in the United States in the last 24 hours from this disease. But Trump says, go on with your life. Now data, now, can you imagine, by the way, if 8,000 people died because an immigrant killed them? Can you imagine it if one person died, if a terrorist killed 20 people, people would be up in arms. 8,000 people died from coronavirus in the last 24 hours. Nobody in the White House seems to give a crap. Now data from the John Hopkins University reveals that the United States still holds the number one spot for the most coronavirus cases and the most, most deaths worldwide. The Washington Post is reporting that cases in more than 20 states have hit new records, mostly in the Midwest. In Europe, the World Health Organization recorded more than 700,000 new cases. They are up 34%. Coronavirus is up 34% in Europe in the past week alone. In immigration news, this is very sad. In immigration news, Mexico has identified two women who may have been subjected to non-consensual surgeries while detained by U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. USCIS, the Department of Homeland Security, is giving non-consensual surgeries to detained immigrants, mostly women. You get arrested by ICE and they give you a surgery that you did not agree to, usually on a female. The finding is part of a larger Mexican investigation into allegations of improper medical care for detained migrant women at ICE's privately run Irwin County Detention Center in Georgia. In a statement released during the weekend, Mexico's foreign ministry said one Mexican national received a surgical intervention she didn't authorize. The ministry specified that the operation was not a hysterectomy, but, did not but she did not also receive any post-operative care. The woman also did not receive treatment for a hernia, the statement adds. A second woman in Mexico allegedly underwent a gynecological surgery without her full consent. 
The statement says she did not receive an explanation in Spanish of the medical diagnosis or the nature of the procedure. The government says it is verifying all of this. Uh, at least 20 women have been interviewed by Mexican officials as part of this ongoing investigation. All right, we got to get to something. We got to let the uh, camels out and we got to get to something we like to call hump day news. Do we have any camels? Where are the camels? Where are the camels? Do we have some camels out? We have, ah, the camels are out. All right, let's go. All right. Uh, anybody know what OkCupid is? It's a dating app where, you know, it's kind of like, I guess, Tinder. You swipe left, you swipe right, you match, you date. Well, this dating app, OkCupid, is now celebrating all those who are flexing their democratic rights this election year. The campaign is in full gear. The election is only 20 days away, and they now have a new campaign underscoring the sexy side of voting. VILF. Yes, it stands for exactly what you think it stands for. Launches as more than 115,000 people on OkCupid enable the app's badge, which shows potential quarters they're registered to vote. They are a VILF, not a MILF, but a VILF. The badge is cemented in data that reveals voters are 85% more likely to have someone message them on the app and 63% more likely to get a match if they voted. The campaign, which was created in partnership with the ad agency Mischief, labels voters VILFs, asking them, excuse me, cover your ears, cover your ears, asking them to fuck people, not fuck America. The campaign VILF has all sorts of branded merchandise, including condoms, lawn signs, but, uh, button pins. Uh, meanwhile, an influencer makeup tutorial on how to look hotter takes an unexpected turn when viewers are instead instructed how to vote. You're a VILF. Voters, I'd like to, you know what, F. Voters, I'd like to, mm, I already said it once. Meanwhile, there's another new campaign to get people to vote called Get Your Booty to the Poll. Founder Angela Barnes thought it would be a great idea to have exotic dancers from some of Atlanta's finest strip clubs tell their patrons and fans to go get their booties to the poll. Angela teamed up with Paul Fox, a prop master turn producer based out of Atlanta, and they recruited a slew of talented filmmakers and dancers, started a GoFundMe called Angela and Paul Want Black People to Vote. They filmed their message in one day at the end of July, all while fearing the second wave of COVID. The entire crew was made up of volunteers who were dedicated to the message and idea of increasing voter turnout amongst black male demographic. Talking about men, Chinese researchers have found that men with deep voices are more likely to cheat on their partners. The sound-breaking study was published in the journal Personality and Individual Differences. While females largely find lower acoustics more arousing, like uh, um, uh, talking like this, talking very low from your diaphragm, this is, seems to be more arousing Masculine sounding, but I don't talk like that. Masculine sounding men are also more likely to engage in infidelity. People who with these low voices are more likely to cheat. The scientists reached this conclusion by surveying an anonymous group of heterosexual Mandarin speaking university students comprised of 116 men, 145 women. After recording their voices to gorge their pitch, the team asked participants how likely they were to remain faithful to their partners on a scale of one to 10. Uh, when uh, my girlfriend found out about this, I answered like, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I don't know, I don't know anything. Um, stupid of me. All right, uh, fed up bride ambushes fiance for surprise wedding at Target. This was kind of funny. An unnamed Nevada woman marched into a Target store where her fiance allegedly works in Henderson, Nevada to demand that he marry her right then and there. In a now viral video taken by a shocked shoppers, Ashley Dominguez, uh, and posted to TikTok last Friday, the impatient bride dressed in white and with a bridesmaid and a pastor in tow, ambushed her boyfriend as he was stocking the shelves at the Target. She demanded, you put this ring on my finger two years ago, it's time to get it done or get out. She then turned to her entourage and announced, I bought the pastor. I brought Emily. She's my bridesmaid. 
Emily wore a blush colored mini dress, white pumps and carried white roses. She added, we're getting married right now or I'm leaving, I'm out of here. And said to the onlookers, hi guys, I'm just finally making him commit, you know? Now Dominguez who had stopped by the store for a birthday present for her son said, this was the best part of my week. I watched this woman hunt this man down who works at the Target. The boyfriend then asked to talk outside and the whole wedding party made their way out. We do not know what happened outside if the marriage actually took place or not. And that, folks, is our hump day of the week. Happy hump day to everybody. We now have to get into answering our immigration questions. Uh, before we get into answering our immigration questions, I got to remind everybody that this is the time that we will be answering your immigration questions. Leave your questions in the comment section. If you're watching on YouTube, leave those questions there right now. If you're watching on Facebook, leave your questions on Facebook. Also start your watch parties on Facebook. You can be the master of your own video, starting your watch parties. Please tell your friends and family. If you are watching on YouTube, you can copy this in a WhatsApp, send it to everybody you want. Most important thing is get the word out. But right now, I'm going to be answering your immigration questions. All right, so we're going to start on YouTube today. Jenna Kane asks, my last name and my passport is different than my advanced parole last name as I took my husband's last name. Can I travel without an issue? Uh, you need to travel with your marriage certificate to show how your last name changed. So travel with your passport, travel with your advanced parole, also travel with your marriage certificate to show the name change. If you were divorced and this is not your first marriage, travel with the divorce as well. Uh, then you won't have a problem. Uh, Layla Smith with a question. My child turned 20 last September. When this ban will be over, I'm worried uh, my LPR child case is still at the National Visa Center, all documented, waiting for an interview. Layla, you need to contact somebody right now. Even though there is a proclamation preventing uh, immigration in this visa category, there is an exception for children turning 21. They will process those children who are going to age out very shortly. Contact me so I can contact the National Visa Center or contact the National Visa Center yourself. You should be worried. They're not going to do nothing for you unless you tell them, hey, under the proclamation, there's an exception. You're supposed to process this case because my child's going to age out. Uh, Yvonne Craig, by the way, Raha Dunal wants to know, how can I talk to Mr. Brad? Okay, Raha Dunal, right below my chin right now, you will see, let's, let's go again, okay, where's my finger? Uh, right, well, there it is, it says, I, I, I'm getting it backwards, right there, call Brad for a consultation, there's my big finger, call Brad for a consultation. That's how you find it, right there, 1-800-529-5465. Internationally, 1-212-227-8933. All right, Yvonne Craig, what are the simulations on filing for a vowel case? If I'm the petitioner, I caught him cheating on me. What are, I guess you're asking, what is the situation on filing for a VAWA, Violence Against Women's Act? You're not filing for an A-E-I-O-U. You're filing for abuse. You catching a man cheating is not abuse. That's a man cheating on you. Um, now, the cheating could be part of a greater level of extreme and emotional hardship against you. Uh, but the act of cheating is not itself abuse, but it could be used as a point of many different points to show extreme emotional abuse. Uh, tier, depending on the situation, obviously. Tia Pesord with a question. Uh, Amina Mar, I have a question, Uncle Brad. How can I ask? Right in the comments, ask. Uh, Tia Pesord, Uncle Brad, is it safe to travel for one week to my home country on approved advance parole with my US citizen husband? 
uh, but had overstayed my visa for five years or wait to my interview to get a green card. No, you can go home for a month. Don't go home for more than a month. You can travel on the advanced parole. It's perfectly fine. Leslie Benoit, hello, Brad. What does it mean enter the United States without inspection? That means you didn't come, you were not, you didn't come to a port of entry, whether you, you know, whether at a border crossing showed a document that allowed you to enter and was lawfully entered. That means you entered at a time and place that was not a border crossing. You didn't show the a, uh, anything. For example, somebody who runs across the border from Mexico, somebody who you know is in the trunk of a car that gets driven across. Uh, anybody who doesn't have uh, an inspection at a border entered without inspection. That's exactly what it means. Jessica Omo, hi Brad. I initially used my husband for the affidavit of support, but didn't put the essential supporting documents. And then I got an RFE and then I used my uncle. Can I still use my husband when I go for the interview? Uh, well, you definitely need your husband no matter what. So I assume your husband is your sponsor. So even if your husband, you know, doesn't earn enough money, he has to give the affidavit support. Now your uncle gave a second one. That's great. But whoever your petitioner is has to do it. I think that's your question. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, Mundo Adiri, is advanced parole excluded from the travel ban? Yes, it's excluded. Daniel K. Hi, Brad. Can someone withdraw an I-130 case that's approved by USCS? On, uh, it's at the National Visa Center. Uh, is it possible? Please explain. Yes, you can write a letter. The petitioner has to write a letter, not the beneficiary. The petitioner has to write a letter and say, please withdraw. It's perfectly fine. Uh, you just write a letter, say, here's my case number. I am withdrawing the case. Thank you very much. Akinola Elisinella. Hi, can I apply for graduate studies and accept a scholarship and research assistant role with an R2 visa? An R2 visa is a visa, I guess you're a family member or a spouse of a religious worker who is here on a temporary basis. No, you cannot do that. What you can do is change to a student visa uh, and, uh, and go for your graduate studies. She loved Joseph. Good afternoon. My question for today is if I married a United States citizen and I don't want to change my last name, is that a problem when I file my immigration papers? It is not a problem. It is a modern world. You do not have to take your husband's name. You can keep your maiden name. What's most important is that you live with your husband, you physically live together, and you have a financial relationship. It's not relevant whether you take his name or not. Uh, AJ, hey, Brad, how long does it take to get an 18-month extension after filing the I-751? Pre-corona, pre it would come in two to three weeks. Post-corona, meaning you know corona times, four to six weeks. Sylvester Garvin, Garvlin, hey, Brad, my wife and I got interviewed since 2018 in September. Till now, I haven't gotten my green card. What's the hold? Well, I don't have my magic eight ball, but if my magic eight ball was here, it would say, I don't know what the hold is. Um, it could be one of many things. One, they didn't believe it was a real marriage, and they're investigating your marriage, and I could call you back for a Stokes interview. That's the most likely scenario. Another scenario is uh, the immigration officer just forgot about you. You know, put your put your application in a drawer and forgot to open the drawer for two and a half years. Who knows? Uh, maybe your fingerprints didn't clear. I don't know what the reason is. I have no idea. I'm not clairvoyant. I, I can't go. Hmm. The reason is, I don't know because I didn't handle it. But uh, what you can do is you can contact me and the solution to all of this, assuming you're in a bona fide marriage and everything is, you know, on the up and up, uh, is to file a mandamus, a threat to file a mandamus, because, you know, when you're married to a United States citizen, you're an immediate relative. Immediate relative means you're immediately eligible for a green card. And obviously filing in 2018, and we're now 2020, and it's two years later, uh, that's not immediate green card. That's that's delay, un unnecessary, unreasonable delay, and that's why you would file a mandamus. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Pam Paramjit Chiron. Hello, Brad. I have a DUI in July 2015. They transferred the DUI to a reckless driving in January 2016 on my court hearing. 
I was under 0 0.08 limit and I'm a green card with asylum. Can I travel out outside of the US? Sounds like you should be able to. Reckless driving uh, should not be a problem traveling. I would want to see the disposition, but uh, not knowing more, I would say, you know, 999 out of a thousand times based on what you told me, you have no problem. Mr. Skyline. Hi, Brad. Good job. Thank you, Mr. Skyline. Does the new public charge rule prohibit green card holders from becoming citizens if they used emergency Medicaid? No, it does not. There is no public charge rule for becoming a U.S. citizen. The public charge rule is for getting a green card or for green card holders who remained outside of the United States for more than six months, they could have public charge issues when they come back. Milislav Minkoff, Uncle Brad, oh, it's not a question. He's just giving me a pat on the back and a thank you very much, Milislav. He's saying, Uncle Brad, that's no surprise. You have the best broadcast on multiple platforms with hundreds of people watching. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and by the way, Mr. Skyline, also a Libra sharing my birthday, also on September 27th. Happy birthday to you, Mr. Skyline, from about two weeks ago. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Show him in, show him in. Hey, Brad, I went on an interview on September 8th, 2020. On September 9th, 2020, they updated my status for other interview on the notice. They stated action completed, approved for filing. What does mean, Brad? I got to read that again, showman, showman. Hey, Brad, I went on an interview September 18th. On September 9th, they updated my status for other interview. On the notice, uh, they stated action completed, approved for filing. I don't know what that means, um, but hopefully you'll get your green card soon. Um, they, they said notice, they stated action completed. It means they, they completed your interview. That's what it means. And hopefully you'll get a decision very shortly. Uh, Felix Blues, hey Brad, how are you doing? Keep up the good work. Been waiting for three months now for my N400 and no response. Should I be worried? Well, did you file? Did you file your, um, you filed your citizenship, uh, but you didn't get a receipt notice? Is that what you're saying? Or did you um, go for an interview and you haven't got a response back yet? I'm not sure what you're saying. Uh, if you got an interview and it's been three months, that could be a little more problematic. Uh, also, if you filed and you didn't get a receipt for three months, make sure your check got cleared. Be a little more specific. Uh, God's property. Hi, Brad. I just got to the United States with my immigrant visa. The first question, when would I get my green card? I paid my immigrant fee on the 5th of October. Uh, second question, can I work with my immigrant visa? Hi, Brad. I just got to the United States with my immigrant visa. My first question, when would I get my green card? Uh, hopefully soon. I paid my immigrant fee on the 5th of October. So it should take about eight to 12 weeks. Can you work with your immigrant visa? You can absolutely work with your immigrant visa. Mr. J. Ivies, hey Brad, I sent my application for adjustment of status uh, based on marriage as a K-1 on August 26, 2020. I have been no response since then. They can't see it in your system. What would you advise my family? Um, I would advise that you contact me. You filed your adjustment of status uh, six weeks ago. Did your check get cleared? That's the most important thing. If you have a check that got cleared, that means they have it. If it's now six, seven weeks later and your check has not been cleared, uh, then at that point, um, excuse me one second, my, my child doesn't stop texting me. So I will have to stop my show, stop, I'm on my show. Enough. My children are driving me banana cakes. Okay. Um, hey, Brad, I sent my application for adjustment of status based on marriage as a K-1. I did that one. Myola Lee. Hi, Uncle Brad. I have two questions. My husband filed for my kids in Jamaica. One got approved and the next one is still waiting. 
He did the filing on November 15th, 2019. He's under 21. What can we do? Uh, my husband filed for my kids in Jamaica. One got approved and the next one is still waiting. He did the filing. It, I don't know what, why one got approved and one didn't. What you can do is contact me uh, and we can follow up. And if we have to do a mandamus, you have to do a mandamus. I'm not sure why one got approved and one didn't. So we got to we gotta figure that one out. Uh, Darnia Polatz. Hey, Brad, how much does it cost to file for a mandamus? You're asking my legal fee? It's several thousand dollars. It depends on each particular case. Uh, God's property. Hi, Brad. Can I work in the USA with just an immigrant visa? I'm waiting for my green card. Yes, you can. All right. Let's go over to Facebook and see what's going on on Facebook. Uh, Omari Palm with a question. I have a question. I'm getting married in a few months and I want her to attend my wedding here in the USA. She only has a passport. So is there something I can file to get her to attend? Who's her, Omari? Is this your wife, your, your parent? Who are we talking about? I'm not sure who you're talking about. Uh, Stargirl Mika, Brad, do I have to apply for a prima facie renewal? If yes, how soon before it expires? You can only need to apply for a prima facie renewal if you need, prima facie allows you to get government benefits. So if you're getting government benefits, uh, yeah, you need to apply for a new one. Do it 120 days beforehand. If you're not getting government benefits, then why the hell do you need it? Um, let's see. Uh, what else we got here? Um, uh, Melinda Malcolm. Good day, Brad. My priority date is June 30th, 2013. I got my I-130 approved May 15th. I'm in the F3 category. When will I hear from the National Visa Center? Uh, let's see what the priority dates are for, um, uh, for um, the F3 category, uh, Visa Bulletin. Uh, let's see what it is. And for the F3 category, the Visa Bulletin for October 2020 is, uh, unfortunately, June 15th, 2018. So you have at least four or five more years to go, unfortunately. Um Let's see, uh, what else we have here? Who else we got? Who else we have? Alex Braun with a question. Squad up Uncle Brad, is USCIS processing EB3 visas if you are in the United States? Absolutely they are. Um, everything is being processed in the US. The only thing with proclamations is people outside of the United States. So if you're asking, can you do things in the US? The answer is yes. Um, Let's see what else we have here. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Baye Falk has a question. My girlfriend is from Hungary. She overstayed her visa. She has a training as a home health aide, and she's inquiring if her 92-year-old friend with whom she has been living and helping for three, na three years now can sponsor her so that she can work for her. I mean, conceivably, I guess you can get sponsored by a 93-year-old person as an employer, employee relationship. Problem is, how is she going to adjust her status if she's overstayed her time? And more likely, this 93-year-old person may pass away because they're old uh, before the green card is up. So it's probably not a good idea to do. Um, in, in, in theory, it can be done, but in reality, it's not going to work. Um... Daniel Faircloth with a question. I'm a green card holder and I filed for my stepson 18 years, then became a citizen. Will they expedite his process? Yes, they should. Make sure that you let them know that they're a citizen. Um, let's see what else we have here. <laughs> Chioma Ioni Nawabuz with a question. Hello, Uncle Brad. I got my notice of receipt. It's August 21st priority date. What does that mean, please? Uh, it means that immigration accepted your application, whatever it is, on August 21st. That's what a priority date means. Um, 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 uh, Daniel Faircloth, again, Brad, what if I came on a fiance visa and we broke up? Do I have to go back to my country or can I remarry to my newfound love? 
you can get remarried, but um, if you didn't marry the first person, you're not going to be able to adjust your status here. You would have to do a provisional waiver, go home, and then the issue becomes when you go home, you got to prove your first relationship was real and your second relationship was real. You're going to have to be prepared to explain why you didn't get married the first time around because they want to be concerned that you didn't commit fraud just to come to the United States of America. So the answer is yes, you can get married. No, you can't adjust your status here. Yes, you have to go home. Yes, you have to do a provisional waiver. Be prepared to discuss both relationships. You need a lawyer. Um, let's see what else. Moya Douglas with a question. Uncle Brad, my United States citizen husband filed for my kids. One got approved. We're still waiting from USCIS for the next child. He's under 21. Filing date was November 15th. My next question is the National Visa Center asked us for to resubmit a marriage certificate. What should we do? Take it to the interview or submit it? Well, if they asked you to submit it, follow the directions and submit it. Uh, the first question is I filed for my kids. One got approved. We're still waiting from USCS for the next child. He's under 21. I think that was a question you asked earlier. I don't know why one got approved and one didn't. I have no idea. Um, they, if they were both done at the same time and they were both under 21 and they were both sponsored by the same step parent, they showed both should have been approved at the same time. So I don't know why it, it wasn't. I don't know what was done, where the error was, where the mistake is. Was it bureaucracy? Was it you? I would need to get involved and I'm sure I'll get it fixed, but you're asking me why it hasn't been approved. I don't have the slightest idea why it wasn't approved. Uh, Cuccio T. Hey, Brad, I filed for an I-360 six months ago. I didn't know that if I wanted to work permit, I had to file at the same time as the I-360. Can I still file for my work permit now? Uh, Cuccio, you're still wrong a little bit. When you file an I-360, you can file for a work permit, except they're not going to approve the work permit until your I-360 is approved, which won't be for 18 to 24 months. So if you file the I-765 with the I-360, and that's all you do, you would be filing the I-765 under the C-31 category, which is I-360 application. They're not going to approve that till your I-360 is approved, which is 18 to 24 months, maybe even longer down the line. The way to get a work permit with the I-360 is to, is to, to file an adjustment application, the I-485 concurrently with the I-360. You do the I-765 work permit on, as Section C-9, and that allows you to get your work permit. Now, I gave you a lot of I's and 7's and 6's and C's and all of that. Rewind you'll understand. If you still don't, give me a call. The number's on the bottom. Uh, Stargirl Mika with lots of questions. I already asked, I answered that Stargirl with uh, the prima facie. Um, let's see what else we got here. Rose Hines. Hi, Uncle Brad. Can a person be an affidavit of support for someone if the government is the one who files her taxes each year? She doesn't file taxes yearly. The government does it for her. Her husband died in the army years ago. The government buried him and they do it all for her. The social security, file her taxes. She recently bought a house on and work. Could she be an affidavit of support for someone? Yeah. doesn't matter who files your taxes or where you get the income from. As long as you get the income, you can be an affidavit of support if you, if they meet the poverty guidelines. Uh, Maurice Parker with a question. I did my I-45 interview in December, 2019. When I reach out to USCIS, I get a mail saying my case is delayed because the required security check is still pending. What does that mean? Is it something good or bad? Well, they always use the security check. The security check, they always use that as the catch-all for, we haven't approved your case yet. Now, I don't know why they haven't approved your case yet. It could be that they don't believe you're in a bona fide marriage. It could be a security check. It could be a hundred different reasons. Uh, but that's the catch-all phrase. So you don't really know why um, that that is the case. So, um, you know, the only thing I can say is, generally speaking, if you've done an interview and your case is pending more than six months and it's a marriage case, expect a second interview. They're going to give you a Stokes interview most likely. Um, let's see what else we have here. Sanir Jenner. I got denied my citizenship last year because of a DUI conviction while I was waiting for my citizenship. How long do I have to wait to apply again? 
five years from the end of the conviction or three years if you're married to a U.S. citizen. Uh, Patrona May, hey Brad, I'm here from 2016. I filed for my kids. Two of them are here. One is left back in Jamaica because of the president proclamation. Am I eligible for naturalization from last? I am eligible for naturalization from last year. I'm a U.S. citizen. I'm a U.S. citizen spouse. I don't know what will happen after the election. What can you do for me? I filed for my kids. Two of them are here. One is left back in Jamaica because of the president. Well, if your husband filed for your child and they're under 21, the proclamation doesn't count towards your child. He's the child or she's a child of a U.S. citizen under the age of 21. If your husband isn't filing for your child, uh, he should. If you're not with, and you said you're with your husband, so he should be the one filing for your child. And that's, that's the answer. Have your spouse file for your child. Child's under 21. You don't have a proclamation issue. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Lovey, Lima Tango. Hello, Uncle Brad. My friend got married. She got her first green card, but her husband says the marriage is not working and they're going to get separated. Would this affect her stay? Absolutely. Because she has to go back in two years and prove it was a bona fide marriage. Now, if they're not together anymore, you can still prove it's a bona fide marriage either by getting a divorce or by uh, proving abuse. So there's other ways to do it. She just got to figure out which way to do it. So just because you ended an unhappy marriage doesn't mean you won't get your green card. Just means a couple more hurdles to overcome. But it'll you, she'll be fine as long as she can prove it was a real marriage. Rose Hines with a question. Oh, I answered that question already. Uh, I also answered Maurice Parker's question. Uh, Kuchia, I answered. Lovey, I answered. People are asking it several times. Brooklyn is set to with a question. Hey, Brad, I live in Mexico and I'm from Ethiopia. I'm waiting on my CR1 visa. I got a DQ last month. Uh, can I change my interview, please, from Mexico to Ethiopia? Uh, yes, if you're, if you're living in Mexico and you want to go back to Ethiopia and you're an Ethiopian citizen, you absolutely can. Um, uh, Daniel Faircloth with more information. Hey, Brad, so the person did marry on the K visa. They are now divorced and the current fiance pregnant is a citizen. Can they remarry? The guy has to go back home. The answer is the same. If they're remarrying, you would have to do a uh, provisional waiver, go back home, prove both marriages were real. If, if Daniel Flaircloth, the person did get married and the spouse started an adjustment application and then withdrew it, then an affidavit of support was completed on behalf of uh, this person, then they can file an adjustment uh, under matter of cesse, they would not have to go home. They would be able to do it here. They would be doing it still through the first marriage, not through the second. So it depends on how far that first marriage went along. Uh, Shem Faith Man, undocumented or not allowed to work, right? Right. Uh, Martha Monzo, can an undocumented immigrant get a green card without leaving if they entered without inspection? Sometimes it depends on the situation. Gailey A.E., hey, Uncle Brad, the U.S. Embassy is closed in my country, Haiti, which puts on hold the I-130 interview appointment for my husband. I'm a U.S. citizen. What should I do? Contact us and let's, uh, there's possibly somebody there who can help. I don't know. We haven't spoken to Haiti in a while. Uh, but contact us and let's see what we can do on your behalf. Um, hi, Brad. Is it true that visitors are now barred from getting married when they arrive as visitors since, since 2020? No, that's not true at all. I don't know what you're talking about. Ian Felix, Brad, my mother sponsored me. I received an approval notice that I have to go to my country for the interview. Is that the law? Brad, my mother sponsored me. Uh, it depends. Are you 245i? Are you over 21? Are you under 21? Are you in legal status? There's a lot more, Ian, than that's, is that the law? I would need to know a lot more about you. And finally, the last question on Facebook, Shirlene Logan, can a green card holder sponsor a wife? Yes. And if so, how long? About two years right now without a proclamation. We'll see what's going on. Let's go quickly back to YouTube. Hi, Brad. How can I work in the USA with an immigrant visa? I'm waiting for my green card. You can work with the immigrant visa. Uh, that's proof of legal status. Um, Paramond per Semar, 
I filed an extended application I-539 on July 20th, 2020. I have not received any letter to do the biometrics. Am I still stuck in New York? Um, you don't need to do a biometric for an I-539. If you have a receipt notice, you can leave whenever you want and complete the case. Don't wait in New York and overstay just because you haven't gotten a decision yet. I think you need a consultation. Uh, Ola Sami Amabola, Uncle Brad, how many days does it take before a person can receive a work permit after the biometric for an asylum applicant? Uh, it's 180 days. You can file for your work permit and then about four to five months after that after that, although there is a rule that asylum applicants are supposed to get their work permits in 30 days. Tashi Codner, hi, Brad. I did my I-360 from September 2018. I got a prima facie, October 2018. I haven't heard anything from USCS from that. It's been two years now. Uh, I'm only keep getting a work permit. Do I have to worry? No, they're taking a long time. Don't worry. Um, Dean Stiles Hall, a friend of mine's mother received a letter saying that they will send a welcome letter to the applicant. This was in June. Should she be worried? No, she should be thrilled. That means she's getting her green card. It should be the opposite of worried. Uh, and lastly, the last question of the day from Moki. Hi, I just have a general question. Can I apply for an EB3 adjustment of status after getting approval of my I-140 if I still have a pending change of status B2 to F1 applicate, application for two years? Uh, you, you can, but you got to still make sure that B2 to F1 actually gets approved. And I don't know why it's taking you two years. So that could be problematic. Why did it take so long? All right, let's do something we like to call comments of the day. One from Star Girl Mika, Brad Bernstein. Love you like stew peas with pigtails. It's all hearts. Thank you very much, Star Girl. The second comment of the day, Marcia McCullough. Congratulations, Brad Show Live, for being nominated for an award. Thank you very much. It's three awards, not just one. And our last comment of the day comes from Mimi. Sorry, squat up, Uncle Brad. Bless your heart for helping us. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you all. We'll be back tomorrow with another. Brad Show Live Quarantine Edition. We'll be back on Friday for another Brad Show Live Quarantine Edition. But on Monday, the whole crew's back in our studio. Yo, yo, Vanessa, Brad, the whole crew for an entire Brad Show Live show, just like the old days, just like you remember it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all tomorrow. Have a great night.